Hello again. Welcome, sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. My name's David, and we are reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. This is chapter nine. Now, before we get started, what happened in chapter eight is the kids finish dinner, and as they're talking about everything that's going on, Edmund sneaks off to visit the White Witch. Chapter nine, in the witch's house. And now, of course, you want to know what happened to Edmund. He had eaten his share of the dinner, but he hadn't really enjoyed it because he was thinking all the time about Turkish delight. And there's nothing that spoils the taste of good ordinary food half as much as the memory of bad magic food. And he had heard the conversation and he hadn't enjoyed it much either because he kept thinking that the others were taking no notice of him and trying to give him the cold shoulder. They weren't, but he imagined it. And then he had listened until Mr. Beaver had told them about Aslan and until he had heard the whole arrangement for meeting Aslan at the stone table, it was then that he began very quietly to edge himself under the curtain which hung over the door. For the mention of Aslan gave him a mysterious and horrible feeling, just as it gave the others a mysterious and lovely feeling. Just as Mr. Beaver had been repeating the rhyme about Adam's flesh and Adam's bone, Edmund had been very quietly turning the door handle. And just before Mr. Beaver had begun telling them that the White Witch wasn't really human at all, but half a gin and half a giantess, Edmund had gotten outside into the snow and cautiously closed the door behind him. You mustn't think that even now Edmund was quite so bad that he actually wanted his brother and his sisters to be turned into stone. He did want Turkish delight and to be made a prince and later king and to pay Peter back for calling him a beast. As for what the witch would do with the others, he didn't want her to particularly be nice to them, certainly not to put them on the same level as himself, but he managed to believe, or pretend he believed, that she wouldn't do anything very bad to them. Because, he said to himself, all those people who say nasty things about her are her enemies, and probably half of it isn't true. She was jolly nice to me, anyway, much nicer than they are. I expect she is the rightful queen, really. Anyway, she'll be better than that awful Aslan. At least, that was the excuse he made in his own mind for what he was doing. It wasn't a very good excuse, however, for deep down inside, he really knew that the White Witch was bad. The first thing he realized when he got outside and found the snow falling all around him was that he left his coat behind in the beaver's house. The next thing he realized was that the daylight was almost gone for it had been nearly three o'clock when they had sat down to dinner and winter days were short. He hadn't reckoned on this, but he had to make the best of it. So he turned up his collar and shuffled across the dam. Luckily, it wasn't so slippery since the snow had fallen to the other side of the river. It was pretty bad when he reached the far side. It was growing darker every minute. And what with that and the snowflakes swirling all around him, he could hardly see three feet ahead. And then too, there was no road. He kept slipping into deep drifts of snow and skidding onto frozen puddles and tripping over fallen tree trunks and sliding down steep banks and barking his shins against rocks till he was wet and cold and bruised all over. The silence and the loneliness were dreadful. In fact, I really think he might have given up the whole plan and gone back and owned up and made friends with the others if he hadn't have happened to say to himself, when I am king, the first thing I'm going to do is make some decent roads. And of course that set him off thinking about being king and all the other things he would do. And this cheered him up a great deal. He had just settled in his mind what sort of palace he would have and how many cars and all about his private cinema and where the principal railways would run and what laws he would make against beavers and dams and was just putting the finishing touches on some schemes for keeping Peter in his place when the weather changed. First, the snow stopped. Then a wind sprang up and it became freezing cold. Finally, the clouds rolled away and the moon came out. It was a full moon and shining on all that snow, it made everything almost as bright as day. Only the shadows were rather confusing. 
He would never have found his way if the moon hadn't come out by the time he had gotten to the other river. You remember the one he had seen when they had first arrived with the beavers? A small river flowing into the great one lower down. He now reached this and turned to follow it up. But the little valley down which it came was much steeper and rockier than the one he had just left and was much overgrown with bushes so that he could not have managed it in the dark. Even as it was, he got wet through for he had to stoop under the branches and great loads of snow came falling off onto his back. And every time this happened, he thought more and more about how he hated Peter, just as if this had all been Peter's fault. But at last he came to a part where it was more level and the valley opened up and there on the other side of the river, quite close to him, in the middle of a little plain between two hills, he saw what must be the witch's house. And the moon was shining brighter than ever. The house was really a small castle. It seemed to be all towers, little towers with long pointed spires on them, sharp as needles. And they shone in the moonlight and their long shadows looked strange on the snow. Edmund began to be afraid of the house, but it was too late to think of turning back now. He crossed the river on the ice and walked up to the house. There was nothing stirring, not the slightest sound anywhere. Even his own feet made no noise on the deep, newly fallen snow. He walked on and on, past corner after corner of the house, and past turret after turret to find the door. He had to go right around to the far side before he found it. It was a huge arch, but the great iron gate stood wide open. Edmund crept up to the arch and looked inside the courtyard, and there he saw a sight that nearly made his heart stop beating. Just inside the gate, with the moonlight shining on it, stood an enormous lion, crouched as if it was ready to spring. And Edmund stood in the shadow of the arch, afraid to go on and afraid to go back, with his knees knocking together. He stood there so long that his teeth would have been chattering from cold if they had not been chattering with fear. How long this really lasted, I don't know, but it seemed to Edmund to last for hours. Then at last, he began to wonder why the lion was standing so still, for it hadn't moved one inch since he first set eyes on it. Edmund now ventured a little nearer, still keeping in the shadow of the arch as much as he could. He now saw from the way the lion was standing that it couldn't have been looking at him at all. But supposing it turns its head, thought Edmund. In fact, it was staring at something else, namely a little dwarf who stood with his back to it about four feet away. Aha, thought Edmund, when it springs at the dwarf, that will be my chance to escape. But still the lion never moved, nor did the dwarf. And now at last Edmund remembered what the others had said about the white witch turning people into stone. Perhaps this was only a stone lion. And as soon as he thought of that, he noticed that the lion's back and the top of its head were covered with snow. Of course it must be only a statue. No living animal would let itself get covered with snow. Then very slowly, and with his heart beating as though it would burst, Edmund ventured to go up to the lion. Even now, he hardly dared to touch it. But at last, he put out his hand very quickly it was cold stone. He had been frightened of a mere statue. The relief which Edmund felt was so great that in spite of the cold, he suddenly got warm all over, right down to his toes. And at the same time, there came into his head what seemed a perfectly lovely idea. Probably, he thought, that this is the great lion Aslan that they were talking about. She's caught him already and turned him into stone. So that's the end of all their fine ideas about him. Poo poo, who's afraid of Aslan? And he stood there gloating over the stone lion, and presently he did something very silly and childish. He took out a stump of lead pencil out of his pocket and scribbled a mustache on the lion's upper lip, and then a pair of spectacles on his eyes. And then he said, yeah, yeah, silly old Aslan, how do you like being made of stone? You thought yourself mighty fine, didn't you? But in spite of the scribbles on his face, the great stone beast still looked so terrible and sad and noble, staring up into the moonlight that Edmund didn't really get much fun out of jeering at it. He turned away and began to cross the courtyard. As he got into the middle of it, he saw that there were dozens of statues all about, standing here and there, rather as the pieces stand on a chessboard when it's halfway through the game. There were stone satires and stone wolves and bears and foxes and catamountains of stone 
There were lovely stone shapes that looked like women, but were really the spirits of trees. There was a great shape of a centaur and a winged horse and a long lithe creature that Edmund took to be a dragon. They all looked so strange standing there perfectly lifelike and also perfectly still in the bright cold moonlight that it was eerie work crossing the courtyard. Right in the very middle stood a huge shape like a man, but as tall as a tree with a fierce face and a shaggy beard and a great club in its right hand. Even though he knew that it was only a stone giant and not a live one, Edmund did not let go and passed it. He now saw that there was a dim light showing from a doorway on the far side of the courtyard. He went to it. There was a flight of stone steps going up the open door. Edmund went up them, and across the threshold lay a great wolf. It's all right, it's all right, he kept saying to himself. It's only a stone wolf, it can't hurt me. And he raised his leg to step over it. Instantly, the huge creature rose, and with all the hair bristling along its back, opened its great red mouth and said in a growling voice, Who's there? Who's there? Stand still, stranger, and tell me who you are. My name is Edmund, and I'm the son of Adam that Her Majesty met in the wood the other day. And I've come to bring her news that my brother and sisters are now in Narnia, quite close in the beaver's house. She, she wanted to see them. I will tell Her Majesty said the wolf. Meanwhile, stand still on the threshold as you value your life. Then it vanished into the house. Edmund stood still and waited, his fingers aching with cold and his heart pounding in his chest. And presently, the gray wolf, Mogram, the chief of the witch's secret police, came bounding back and said, Come in, come in, fortunate favorite of the queen, or else not so fortunate. And Edmund went in, taking great care not to tread on the wolf's paws. He found himself in a long, gloomy hall with many pillars, full as the courtyard had been of statues. The one nearest the door was a little fawn with a very sad expression on his face, and Edmund couldn't help wondering if this might be Lucy's friend. The only light came from a single lamp, and close beside this sat the White Witch. I've come, your majesty, said Edmund, rushing eagerly forward. How dare you come alone? said the witch in a terrible voice. Did I not tell you to bring the others with you? Please, your majesty, said Edmund. I've done the best I can. I've brought them quite close. They're in the little house at the top of the dam up the river with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. A slow, cruel smile came over the witch's face. Is this all your news? She asked. No, your majesty, said Edmund, and proceeded to tell her all that he had heard before leaving the beaver's house. What? Aslan? cried the queen. Aslan, is this true? If I find you have lied to me. Please, I'm only repeating what they said, stammered Edmund. But the queen, who was no longer attending to him, clapped her hands and instantly the same dwarf who Edmund had seen with her before appeared. Make ready our sledge, ordered the witch, and use the harness without bells. We'll tune in next time for chapter 10. We'll see what's happening with the other kids and the beavers. Ooh!